Good evening and welcome. And thank you for joining us for this session of the Six Bridges Book Festival. I want to thank the Arkansas Democrat Gazette for sponsoring this session. The support of our sponsors is what makes this festival possible. Our presenter this evening is Ted Widmer. He's a history professor at Macaulay Honors College at the City University of New York. His 2020 book, Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington, won the prize for the best book of the year from the Lincoln Forum. It describes a 1900 mile train ride full of suspense, bringing Lincoln closer to the presidency, but also putting him in harm's way as he draws closer to Washington, the very Southern capital of the United States. Ted has taught at Brown and Washington College, and he was a speechwriter and senior advisor to Arkansas's own Bill Clinton between 1997 and 2001. In writing about the book, the Washington Post wrote, it was a Lincoln classic and superb. And Harold Holzer, writing in the Wall Street Journal, called it, quote, a wholly original, gorgeously reimagined, gorgeously crafted reimagining, and not only a historical achievement, but a literary one. Uh, and if you write a book about Abraham Lincoln, Harold Holzer likes it, that's about, that's about as good as it gets. Uh, we're going to begin this evening by asking Ted to read a brief excerpt from his book, and then I'll ask him some questions, and we'll take questions from the audience. Thank you. Ted, welcome. Thank you so much, Tom. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. Well, I, I have a couple pages to read, and you can just cut me off anytime if I'm going too long. The wind whips across the prairie in late November, hinting at the wrath of winter to come. In 1859, a German immigrant, Henry Villard, was fighting the cold as he drove his wagon east from Colorado, where he'd been living among gold prospectors. Villard had a long way to go, 650 miles in all, snaking along the Platte River through Nebraska and Kansas as he made his way back toward the Missouri River and civilization. He survived by constantly gathering buffalo chips or dried dung, which he burned to stay warm and cook his meals. At night, he slept outdoors covered with buffalo pelts. Quote, the prairie traveler is not particular about toilette, unquote, noted an English traveler after meeting a rough specimen in the same parts who unsheathed a long knife he called his quote unquote Arkansas toothpick. One night it snowed 18 inches, but Villard kept going, desperate to reach his destination before more storms came through. 30 miles west of St. Joseph, Missouri, Villard saw a distant speck on the immense horizon growing larger, kicking up dust. As it came closer, the speck grew into a horse and buddy with buggy with two occupants. Surprisingly, Villard recognized one of the passengers. He'd been in Illinois a year earlier during the excitement of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And as the carriage approached, he began to make out the ungainly form of Abraham Lincoln himself, 400 miles west of where he normally could be found. Lincoln laughed when he realized that Villard had transformed himself into a full-fledged pioneer. A year earlier, Lincoln had known him as a clean-shaven reporter for the German-American press. Now he was almost unrecognizable beneath the luxuriant beard and all those buffalo pelts. For his part, Villard was amazed to encounter Lincoln still smooth-faced with nothing to protect him from the prairie wind except a short overcoat and no covering for his long legs. To make matters worse, he was heading directly into the rough weather Villard had put behind him. It was a frigid morning and the wind blew in from the Northwest, cuttingly as Villard put it. Not far away in Leavenworth, the Missouri River was beginning to freeze as the thermometer plunged towards zero. Lincoln was already shivering in his exposed buggy with no roof and a great distance still to go, but he was determined to continue for he had a speaking engagement and there could be no rest in the struggle to prevent the spread of slavery into these wide open spaces. Villard offered one of his buffalo robes, which Lincoln accepted gratefully. After a short chat, they separated two ships passing in opposite directions. Travelers often compared the prairie to a vast inland ocean. Herman Melville thought it looked like the bed of a dried up sea with its undulating grassy billows resembling waves. In his prairie schooner, Lincoln kept sailing 
into the cold. Is that about right, or should I keep going a little bit more? A little bit more would be good. Tell it. Okay. Tell it. A different account picks up the thread soon after. A young writer, Albert Richardson, was crossing the prairie along a different vector the same day. His destination was a small cluster of wooden structures ambitiously called Troy. The tiny Kansas settlement, population 131, aspired to be a city someday, but, quote, save a shabby frame courthouse, a tavern, and a few shanties, its urban glories were visible only to the eye of faith, unquote. In the piercing cold, it looked even worse than usual. Richardson wrote, the sweeping prairie wind, wind rocked the crazy buildings and cut the faces of travelers like a knife. The English traveler Richard Burton was even harsher. He recorded, passing through a few wretched shanties called Troy, the very name of which was an insult to the memory of the ancient citadel described by Homer. Burton had been through the desert wastes of the Arabian Peninsula and the jungles of Africa, but he considered these prairie landscapes among the most desolate he had ever seen and likened them to, quote, the ends of the earth, unquote. Troy was Lincoln's destination as well. He'd been invited to talk about slavery in the heart of the Kansas territory that seen so much bloodletting. The small town with the crazy buildings was not much more than a smudge on the map, but it was on the front lines of an argument that had raged across Kansas for five years, putting slavery's critics and defenders, pitting slavery's critics and defenders against one another. In small towns like this from door to door, the great question of America's future was being settled. Would this country be free in keeping with the Declaration of Independence and its hymn to human rights? Or would it be a permanent slave society with no rights of any kind for the wrong sort of humans. Thank you. Uh, I've got to tell you, a friend sent me your book, and I thought, I've read so many books about Lincoln. Do I really want to read another book about Lincoln? But I started it, and I could not put it down. And those two passages you just read are one of the reasons why it is so well written. I want to start by asking you how you got the idea to write a book about Lincoln's uh, trip from Springfield to Washington. Well, thank you, Tom, for your very kind words. And, you know, I forgot until I was reading it about the line about the Arkansas toothpick, and I'm so glad that was in there tonight. Um, well, like you, I had read a lot of books about Abraham Lincoln, and I was intimidated. There are so many of them, I think more than 15,000. But I have always been attracted to him since I was a little kid and began to see his photograph and there's something in in his face in his eyes and there's a kind of sadness in there that is different from the way most of our politicians look they're kind of professionally happy all the time and lincoln really is very different and i always felt a desire to get to know him better and I, I read a lot of his speeches. As you mentioned, I, I was a speechwriter for Arkansas's own Bill Clinton in, in the late 1990s. And while there, I was just reading everything I could about presidential speeches and kept coming back to Lincoln really as the best of them all, but still didn't have a way of writing about him. I, I had these strong feelings, but I, I didn't know what to do about them. And then in 2010, I got together with some other historians and we began to work on an online history of the Civil War in the pages of the New York Times at, at a time when the online parts of the New York Times were pretty insignificant. They would let anything go, you know, back in the online pages, recipes or tourism, articles or history. And so with some friends, we started something called Disunion, which was a chance to write very short pieces about what happened on this day 150 years ago. So beginning in 2010, we were working on 1860 and I began to write about Lincoln's election and the split in the country that happened as a result. And I just sort of followed the story closely. What, what was Lincoln up to on this day? 
in November and December and January, and then got to February and I realized he was taking this train trip and I, I thought this is such a great thing to write about. And I, I asked for permission to write for 13 days in a row, what happened on this day 150 years ago. And they let me do it. And it was an incredible ride in every sense. I followed Lincoln's public speeches. I thought that was going to be most of it. But then I just got very interested in the train itself and the cities he was going through. And I, I am an old railroad buff. I, I liked trains when I was a kid. And as I was doing this, and I mean, these were only online essays. They were like blogs. But it was just so fun to follow Lincoln on this train moving through America and going, covering a lot of ground all, all through the Midwest and the North before coming to Washington. And it was just so fun to look at each city. And he had some real danger that he had to confront too. So it, it began to feel like a, a, a fantastic adventure story. And you don't often hear of history described that way. I do like spy novels and adventure movies and but I, I my history books had always been very different from that and for the first time in my life I felt like I have adventure and history in the same package here so I just started working on it and I let a year go by and then I put a book proposal together and Simon and Schuster said yes and then I began it but it took me a long time it took me nine years in all to, to do this book. You're right that the uh... Lincoln recognized the need to get to Washington as soon as possible. South Carolina had seceded in December, I believe, and before he's inaugurated, six more states from the deep south would announce their intention to leave the Union, or have actually claimed to have left the Union. And yet, he didn't take the quick path there. Uh, no. Why? Well, short answer is it was too dangerous. He didn't feel... He would be safe going through Kentucky, which is the state of his birth, and Virginia. And that would have been the shortest way, just get across the Ohio River and then keep going through Kentucky and Virginia. But there were death threats. They were already coming in right around the time of his election. I mean, there were actually death threats in the route that he did go on also. But I think he just felt desperate to keep Kentucky and Virginia in the Union, which they remained in um, up to his inauguration. And that was very, very important. With Virginia, especially being so close to the Capitol, if Virginia had gone into the Confederacy earlier, it might have made it impossible for him to get to Washington. Maryland was very unsettled also. Um, so he just didn't want to do, maybe it wasn't even a fear of being killed. He just didn't want to upset the political atmosphere in Kentucky and Virginia. So he did this very roundabout route. He got close to Kentucky and, and Virginia. He, he went to Cincinnati, which is right across the Ohio River from Kentucky. And then he went to Steubenville, Ohio, which is right across the river, same river, the Ohio from what was then Virginia, now it's West Virginia, but um, he didn't go into either state and he just kept going in this winding route through Ohio and a little piece of Pennsylvania uh, up into upstate New York and then down to New York City, New Jersey, Philadelphia. And then this wild last night of his journey when he secretly took a commuter train in the middle of the night because he was getting so much information about an assassination plot that he thought he should he should sneak through Baltimore at four in the morning rather than go through publicly. One of the things I found most fascinating about the book was the number of notable people that Lincoln encountered during his trip, some who would not be well known at the time, but would become well known later, others who had already made a name for themselves uh, prior to Lincoln's election. Can you talk a little about that? Sure. Well, that that was part of the reason it took me so many years to write this book is I, I really wanted to drop down into every city, every town that he went through and try to figure out who was there. And because he went through Ohio and later upstate New York, he, 
he went through towns where a lot of future presidents were living. A lot of presidents in the late 19th century come from Ohio. So he, he saw some, um, Benjamin Harrison and, um, well, I believe he, he in Cincinnati, he, he might have seen a, an infant William Howard Taft um, and in upstate New York, Grover Cleveland and Millard Fillmore, who had already been president. Um, but in, in every town, everybody came out to see him. He was a very significant celebrity. That word had already been coined, but it wasn't the same thing then that it is now, but there was something about Lincoln that was incredibly exciting to people. He was the first president elected from the Republican Party. He was the first president elected who had promised to do anything about slavery. Um, everyone knew that the South was outraged over his election. And as you mentioned, many states had seceded even before he got on the train. And he was a kind of living symbol of what was about to happen. They didn't quite know the American Civil War was about to begin. They knew something really momentous was about to happen, but they didn't know what. And whatever it was, they knew Lincoln would be at the center of it. So huge numbers, number, I mean, numbers often exceeding the population of a city because so many people from the countryside would come in to to just get a quick glimpse of this man. And you know, also he was a very unusual looking politician with his height and his beard coming in, the first president with a beard and his sort of ungainly features. He looked country, he didn't look like a city slicker. And so everybody just wanted to see this man who symbolized what was about to happen. Uh you talked a little bit about this. You alluded to this threats on his life. Uh, but I was also struck by the, the danger he exposed himself to from people who like him, <laughs> people along this route who almost uh, sometimes almost killed him inadvertently. Because could you talk a little about that and then also about a little more about the guest? A absolutely. Um, you're you're so right to say that they it was sometimes more dangerous for him to be among friends, as you say, than among enemies. And there were a lot of problems. There, there, there wasn't really any experience managing a tour of this magnitude with crowds this big coming out to see him. He only had a small staff with him and they were at the mercy of all these welcoming committees, town after town. And in uh, a small town in Ohio, Xenia, Ohio. Some guns went off that shattered the window next to where he and his wife were, were sitting and all the glass came through the window. And in upstate New York, as you say, a, a, a welcoming cannon actually fired into the train he was on, kind of incredible. He was okay, but it was just, you know, things were out of control. And one really frightening scene happened in Buffalo in the train station when he came in and the, the crowd was so big and so restless that it kept pressing toward him and he couldn't find the exit. And he was stuck in a corner of a big train station with thousands of people, you know, like a rock concert trying to get at him. And there were some soldiers, they, they, I think they were just sort of local militia guys with guns with bayonets, and they were trying to stand next to him to protect him. But the crowd was getting so close that they couldn't even really control their, their arms anymore. And so they, they had lowered their guns with bayonets, and one man was being pressed by the crowd almost into the, the knife of the bayonet and killed right in front of Lincoln. Unfortunately, that did not happen, but it was a matter of inches that it didn't. And Lincoln himself had a very narrow escape. So there was basically no crowd control of any kind in 1861. And Lincoln often was very, very vulnerable. And you know, also that includes the giving of speeches, which he was always doing to save America, to save the country that he was sort of the president of, but 
only of half of the country. He felt he had to keep giving speeches, but that always exposed him to thousands of people, some of whom didn't want him to be president. So it was a very dangerous two weeks. Uh, what kind of, I've always been struck by the fact that when Lincoln was assassinated, there was so little security around him. But uh, talk a little bit about the security on this trip. How, who, who and how was he protected? Well, he did have a little, but not, nothing like what they have today. Um, he had a few soldiers. He'd received some letters from soldiers giving him a, a warning that it was going to be very dangerous, and Baltimore especially was dangerous. And I believe three of those soldiers came with him. So these were Army officers in the U.S. Army from Northern backgrounds. And you know there weren't that many Northern officers in, in the U.S. Army. Then, but he invited them with him. I think that you know they they offered protection in a way, but they were also middle-aged officers. They weren't exactly young guys, physically able to push crowds away. But I think they offered a form of comfort for him to be traveling with officers of the army, felt good and and, and looked good, but really all that he had in town after town was the welcoming committee and some letters usually were exchanged between his people and the small town just saying this is what we want to get off the train if you can have some people around to to kind of create a, a cordon of sec security we would appreciate that but it really wasn't very well organized and often it spun out of control so my feeling after doing more and more research was he really was not very safe for most of this trip. And yet these adoring crowds at the side, there was, and you can talk about this in some detail in your book, there were legitimate threats on his life. There were people out to kill him. I think Harold Holzer said in his review of your book, Harold Holzer being one of the great Lincoln scholars of all yeah. time, uh, <clears throat> said that your book convinced him that these plots had actually originated earlier than even he had thought. Uh, right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And you're, you're absolutely right about Harold. He's a great scholar. And he wrote a book that covered much of the same period, which made me think maybe I shouldn't do it. He wrote a book called Lincoln President Elect, which goes from November to March. And that's not that much time, but I thought I could do another book just about the 13 days of the train trip itself. And so my book is a little different, um, but I found some evidence which is what he was talking about, that warnings were coming into Lincoln while he was still in Springfield, that there was a serious uh, assassination plot forming against him, and that it was probably centered in Baltimore, maybe in Washington, but probably in, in Baltimore. So even getting on the train, he knew he was going into harm's way, and that makes certain things even more Po poetic and, and courageous. Uh, so for example, on the first day of his trip, he gives one of the all-time great Lincoln speeches is his farewell to his hometown of Springfield. He's just getting on the train and he turns to the crowd and he gives a very beautiful speech about living among them, among his friends and what it means to be from a place and how he's going off into this incredibly difficult job and not sure if he will ever come back. And that knowing about the warnings he'd been receiving, it, it feels more powerful. Like he was saying, I know I'm probably not coming back. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a pretty uh, extraordinary thing to be saying to his hometown. And I, I had that feeling while, while doing this research. Baltimore seems to be a particular trouble spot, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but one of the uh, agents, I guess you would say, who was working with him to try, try to inform him was, was, was a woman. Yes. Talk about it. Well, I was so delighted to find strong women in this story because a lot of Civil War history is about men, and I found two remarkable women who basically saved his life. And by saving Lincoln's life, I would say they saved the life of the United States of America. And the first one is 
Dorothea Dix. She's a mental health advocate. She's from New England, but she's very well known in every state and, and has many Southern friends because she's been working at the state level to help each state build a kind of hospital or treatment facility for mentally unhealthy citizens. And while traveling through the South in the fall of 1860, she hears, I, I never have found out where she heard it, but she heard all about the plot to kill Lincoln on the train line near Baltimore. And so she went to the president of the train that connected Washington, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. It's called the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. And she told him what she'd heard. And he hired a group of railroad detectives. The head of that group was Alan Pinkerton, who goes on to be a pretty famous detective in American history. And he brought with him eight agents. So he brought a kind of team of agents to Baltimore to infiltrate the plotters. And one of them was this brilliant spy named Kate Warney, a young widow from Chicago, Illinois, who was incredibly talented at getting information, usually from other women. And she impersonated a woman from Alabama and went around the bars and restaurants of Baltimore and heard everything about the plot to kill Lincoln and, and convinced Pinkerton that it was true. And then they took these um, extraordinary measures of putting Lincoln on a, on an ordinary commuter train in the middle of the night, almost in disguise in a different hat and different jacket, but not, not, not a facial disguise and um, got him through Baltimore to Washington the next day. Uh, he reaches Philadelphia on the 22nd of February, I think, and speaks to Independence Hall. Uh, in an interview you did with C-SPAN, you called it uh, the pivot point of the entire book. And you also referred to it as, quote, the beta version of the Gettysburg Address. Can you elaborate on that? I like that, Tom. I've forgotten that. But I, I, I thank you for your good research. Well, I, I do feel like something special is happening at the end of the trip. So a lot of this book is just the day-to-day -day excitement of a president-elect being on a train, meeting the American people at a very fraught moment of American history. But, and then an, a, a second drama is the assassination danger. But a third drama is Lincoln is growing a lot as a thinker and speaker. And he's using American history to try to unite a people who are not united at, at all. And so he starts out, well, I mentioned the farewell address in Springfield, that, that is a beautiful speech. He gives a few ordinary speeches, but then speeches start to get better. And it's, it's really interesting to me as a former speechwriter that his best speeches begin to come when he has nothing written in front of him. He actually writes a, a kind of a boring speech a few times written out on paper, but then when left to speak with his own devices, he gives these extraordinary speeches near the end of the, the trip. So, on the second to last day, he comes into Trenton, New Jersey, which is a state capital, goes into the state house and gives two quick speeches, one in the state Senate, one in the state assembly, and talks about the meaning of the American Revolution and remembers something from childhood, which is very rare with Abraham Lincoln. We don't hear him talk about his own childhood ever, basically. And you have the feeling it was just a hard life. He lost his mother and his sister and they were very, very poor. And he just didn't really want to go back there. But in this one time in Trenton, he talks about being a boy and reading about George Washington and Valley Forge and crossing the Delaware into Trenton to surprise the Hessians and defeat them and how Lincoln felt from reading that, that there was something special guiding American history. And then the next, that, that night, he got more intelligence about the assassination plot forming against him and went into Philadelphia the next morning and into Independence Hall. And a whole lot of his politics has already been formed around his understanding of the Declaration of Independence in 
and the equal rights that it promises to all, all Americans and all, all people. All, all men are created equal. And men at that moment implied women also. All, all people are created equal. And Lincoln goes in. Sorry. Fred, we've lost uh, Professor Whitmer for just a second. Now, we're back. Good. Oh. You're back. Oh, did you lose me for a second? For a second there, yes. Sorry, but it, I got a little sign saying my internet connection is unstable. So <laughs> okay. hopefully, I don't know what you heard and what you didn't, but I just was saying he loved the American Revolution. He read about it as a kid, spoke about it in Trenton, and then the next morning went into Independence Hall in Philadelphia and gave this very personal statement about what the Declaration of Independence had always meant to him. It formed his politics. And the idea that all people are created equal was central to his thinking. And that was a beautiful way of saying he was anti-slavery without quite saying in the, in the, the language that enraged the South at the time from abolitionist places like Boston, he was saying, we are better than this. We are Americans. Our founding document proclaimed the freedom of all people. So we need to live up to that. And it was a beautiful moment. And the Gettysburg Address two years later, also in Pennsylvania, begins with the, de the Declaration of Independence also. So I, I just think it was a formative moment in his thinking to come through Independence Hall and a stroke of genius on his part to ask for this this event, which I think he probably did. He probably was his own scheduler, as in addition to being the speaker, he probably saw that there was a chance to give a speech in Independence Hall on George Washington's birthday on the way into Washington. And he knew that would be very good PR. So as much as I admire Lincoln as the virtuous man and the great speaker, He's also a pretty smart politician, and I think he saw that the opportunity to speak in Independence Hall would put him in a very patriotic setting just when he needed to look presidential. This is a side note that Philadelphia Union, I was not aware of this. You talk about how Independence Hall uh, itself was tainted with slavery. Uh, go ahead and that, tell well, us that that was a shocking discovery for me. I, I read a really good book on the history of Independence Hall and it had the craziest history. I mean, so it's, it's something before the Declaration of Independence. It's the state capital, well, well, it's not a state, it's the colonial capital of Pennsylvania. It's the building that Mason and Dixon went out from to survey the, the Mason-Dixon line. Then after the, all the excitement of the American Revolution, it becomes a kind of a museum of painting and stuffed animals uh, run by Charles Wilson Peale. But then in the 1840s and 50s, it, it's a kind of multi-purpose government building. And on the second floor, there was a US Marshal's office and that's where escaped slaves were brought after they were captured. So it's a kind of jail for escaped African-Americans, some of whom were, were not slaves at all, but had just been captured because they might resemble an escaped slave. So the building had a very fraught history. It had you know, some great American history had happened there, but some backsliding had also happened there. And I felt like Lincoln was coming in to cleanse it in, in a way. When he leaves there, of course, he's, he's now getting close to Washington, and, and the, but the most dangerous part of the trip remains. Uh, the trip through Baltimore. Uh, with regard to the plots against Lincoln, uh, were they organized plots? Were these just groups of people who were angry with the election results? Oh, how, how, how serious were these uh, plots to assassinate him? I believe they were very serious. It, it's important to say they are still a little bit shrouded in mystery. Nobody knows everything about them. But Alan Pinkerton kept good records. His records are in the Huntington Library in California. And he wrote down everything that his agents, his, his spies were telling him. Uh, 
And they were finding out a lot of information very rapidly about the way they were going to kill him. There were a few ways discussed, including bombs under train bridges, but almost certainly they were going to try to surround his carriage. Baltimore has three train stations and there's about a mile between each of them. So you have to get out and get into a carriage drawn by horses and go to the next one. And while he was going through the streets, pretty vulnerable in a horse and buggy, they were gonna surround him and kill, stab him, shoot him, throw bombs into his carriage. And they had a ship waiting nearby in Baltimore Harbor and the Baltimore police had been paid off to not be present. So there's a lot of evidence that something serious was, was going to happen. You, you obviously finished the book in 2020 before the 2020 election and the events that followed. Uh, but in chapter six, which is called the cheese box, you talk about the events. Uh, you write that unionists were concerned that the Capitol might be occupied by pro-Southern militias. And that very few in Washington, quote, doubted that a conspiracy to seize the government existed. You write of a young Vermont man describing the Capitol as, quote, seething with anger, made more so by an influence of truculent outsiders spoiling for a fight. Late in the morning, they were trying to enter the Capitol to cause trouble during the vote. And you write of the difficulty uh, while all this was going on of trying to pass a spending bill that would keep the government from default and of a vice president who opposed the incoming president, but nonetheless did his duty that day. Uh, in light of recent events, that seems rather prescient. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. I had no idea I was being prescient. I just was re reporting on what I found. But then as the events of this year happened, it was uncanny because it was so similar to a day in 1861. And like Mike Pence, um, uh, the, the John C. Breckinridge, who's the vice president from Kentucky, doesn't like Lincoln, but he certified the counting of the electoral votes on February 13th, 1861, which was the same procedure that Congress was doing on January 6th of this year. And he later became a leading Confederate. He was a cabinet official and a general for the Confederacy, but he thought an election was an election and we had to abide by it. So he, he played a heroic role that, that day. And there were angry crowds outside, but Winfield Scott, who's also a Southerner, he's from Virginia and he's the, the commander in chief of the, of the army, he had, troops stationed around the US Capitol so the crowds couldn't get in. And so two Southerners sort of saved the day for Lincoln to become president, which is remarkable to think about. Yeah, Scott, Scott made it very clear that he wasn't going to brook any kind of inter interference or people trying to get in the Capitol. That's but, right. Uh, is there a sense in which this trip from Springfield to Washington over these 13 days in your opinion, makes Lincoln Lincoln? Is, is the Lincoln that gets off the train in Washington a different man from the Lincoln who boarded the train in Springfield? That is a great question. And I believe the answer is yes. I think he had grown internally. He was giving better and better speeches. And, and you can just see a better, I mean, I don't think he'd ever given as good a speech as the, the farewell address in Springfield and then the speeches in Trenton and then especially that speech in Independence Hall. But also he'd seen so many people. He probably saw around a million Americans in all those small towns and cities. And something I, I would say grew inside of him, which was a, a very strong determination to keep this country intact. He, he believed in the founding of the United States. He loved the, the, the founders, including the Southern founders, Jefferson and, and, and Washington, and he did not want to see this great country split in half. So he was strong, I would say, by the time he got to Washington and
his first inaugural address was already written. Uh, I, I think he, he improved certain sections of it, but he, he had changed from someone who was barely elected and, and not with a very impressive percentage of the vote, less than 40% of the popular vote, to someone who was sort of walking in George Washington's footsteps, who seemed presidential and, and already great in a way, even before he took the oath of office. So it was a kind of trial by fire that he excelled at. And I, I think it was important. One of the difficulties in writing history or reading history, I think, is it's difficult for us to unplug from our present situation, where we see presidents and presidential candidates every day on the news. Uh, to go back to a time when most of these people, the vast majority of these people who had voted for Lincoln, had never seen Lincoln before. Right. And this is their chance to, to see a president, and they took it full advantage of it. Right. I think it was the most people who had ever seen a president. I mean, he's actually president elect. He's not yet president, but um, the most who had ever seen a president or president elect. And for the vast majority of them, it was the only time they saw Abraham Lincoln because he's mostly in Washington, D.C., which is not a very big city during the Civil War. So if you're from Ohio or Pennsylvania or New York or Indiana, you're probably never going to see Abraham Lincoln. If you were from Springfield, Illinois, you would, or Chicago, you probably would. But for most Americans, uh, they never would ever see this person who's second only to George Washington in, in, in terms of importance. And you know, many people would say even more that he's our greatest president ever. So, so this 13-day train trip, I think, was really important both for him to see the American people and for them to see him. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy recent months over the 1619 project. And you have some good things to say about it, but you also, I think, disagree with how Lincoln is characterized in there. Can you talk about that just a second? I do. That's a good question. Um, I really liked the energy and passion and intelligence of those pieces. There are many pieces that comprise the 1619 project and they're, you know, bristling with intelligence and impossible to put down. But I thought the lead essay, which was a kind of lawyerly essay trying to make a point, which is that African-Americans have always been degraded in our history. Um, it tried too hard a couple times and it ignored important evidence on the other side. And maybe that's what lawyers are supposed to do, but historians I think should, should look at all the evidence, including the evidence that works against what they're saying. And the lead essay told a story of a meeting that did happen in August of 1862, in which Lincoln met some African-American leaders and spoke in a way that wasn't very supportive of their aspirations and wondered if they maybe wanted to move with their people to another part of the world with support from the US government. And if maybe that was not the best solution for all the racial trouble that Americans had lived with. And that's the only story told about Lincoln and you're left with the feeling he's a terrible racist. But in fact, that was the first meeting I'm aware of, I'm pretty sure this is true, the first time a president had ever met with African-Americans in the White House, a pretty serious meeting. And while that meeting was happening, he had already drafted and presented to his cabinet the first draft of the Emancipation Proclamation which totally contradicts the logic of the story. The logic of the story is he's sort of daydreaming about some place somewhere outside of the US where African-Americans can go live, but he is well on his way. He's almost all the way there in drafting the Emancipation Proclamation, which is the greatest act of abolition in American history. And there are countless stories of Lincoln's kindness to African-Americans, his interest in their welfare. There's a very interesting book called They Knew Washington. Uh, a, a Black historian of Washington, D.C. 
1940 compiled all the stories that African Americans remembered about Lincoln, and overwhelmingly positive. And you don't have to look any further than Frederick Douglass, who's the greatest African American intellectual and, and defender of his people's rights to equal citizenship in the 19th century. And he revised his opinion of Lincoln and gave, um, well, he actually gave two incredible eulogies of Lincoln that praised him as the, the person who'd come further than anyone ever had and much further than Douglas expected uh, toward the, the crushing of slavery and the liberation of African-Americans and the bringing of equality. So it just felt a little bit gimmicky to me in a, a project I overwhelmingly agreed with and enjoyed, but it felt a little bit cheap to take this shot at Lincoln when he was doing so many other things that actually really contributed to equality. I want to go to a question now from one of our listeners. Uh, and this says, you mentioned Lincoln's skills as a politician. Do you think there were any other presidents with superior political skills? Because Lincoln was pretty good. He sure was. And even the way he did the emancipation is fascinating because he he did a lot of things according to his sense of timing when he thought the country could handle it. And you can look at his first year of being president and argue he didn't say much about slavery at all, except to say he respected its right to exist. But by 1860, well, middle of 1862, he's, he's singing a very different tune, but waiting for a Northern victory so it doesn't seem weak to be freeing the slaves and he waited for Antietam before publicizing his desire to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, but the question is about other presidents who are good at politics and th there are so many of them. I've been teaching a course this fall on Franklin Roosevelt, Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt and, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And FDR was pretty cunning. He, he also understood timing well. He had some advantages. Many other presidents did not have. He had an overwhelming Democratic Congress to, to back him up with what he wanted to do. But he also was a genius at sort of describing what he was doing as patriotic and in the grand tradition of American history, which I think Lincoln understood was, was good politics and persuasive to the American public. Um, we've had some presidents who weren't were good people, but not very good politicians. John Quincy Adams might be, be one. Um, Thomas Jefferson, pretty good politician, I, I would say. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, very good politician. He kind of invented the idea of the very active president who was always in the news and, and entertaining the American people as well as leading them politically. Um, John F. Kennedy, a kind of brilliant marketer of himself, had a kind of incredible public image, but didn't get that much sweeping legislation through. Lyndon Johnson, on the other hand, from a, a state adjoining Arkansas, was a genius of legislation for a long time. And you can read all about him in the Robert Caro books until he hit a kind of wall when he escalated the war in Vietnam and that really destroyed not only his foreign policy, but his domestic policy too. So it's just always so interesting. Some of our most talented presidents have Achilles heels that they're not aware of that, that bring them down. Yeah, well, you work for a pretty good politician too. When you work for Bill I sure did, I sure did, yep. And uh, one thing is clear is that Lincoln understood that he had, he had to sort of tiptoe because of, of Kentucky, of, of, of Missouri, uh, uh, Maryland, that he wanted desperately to keep in, 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 the, un, in the union. So uh, I think he would have, have his political instincts were pretty good. Uh, uh, let me ask you, as, as we wrap this up, uh, what's next for Ted Whitman? Well, thank you, Tom. And I've, I've really enjoyed your questions a lot. I'm thinking about Franklin Roosevelt a bit. Um, this, teaching this course has me thinking about him. As with Lincoln, he's intimidating. There are a lot of books about FDR. Uh, 
but I also think his presidency was very consequential and put our country up on the global stage and has never not been on it since then. So I'm thinking about him. Um, there are some aspects of Lincoln's career I'm still very interested in. I did all that reading for nine years and I don't wanna walk away from it. I just feel a little bit of an urge to try something new, but I'm interested, I have a couple thoughts which a Southern audience might appreciate. One is um, Lincoln had a very unusual friendship with Alexander Stevens of Georgia, who becomes the vice president of the Confederacy, but they are friends when they are in Congress together in the late 1840s, and they have a fascinating correspondence before the country has gone to war. And then they meet again at the end of the Civil War. Stevens is a negotiator for the Confederacy about a possible surrender. And I think their friendship, their former Whigs, it's really very interesting. And I've not seen a book on Lincoln and Alexander Stevens. And I think that could be a really good book. I'm, I'm not sure that's my book, but I'm, I'm interested in it. And I'm interested in, this may surprise you, but the story of Jefferson Davis, who is kind of the, the villain of the story of the Civil War, and in many ways deserves to be. He certainly defended slavery and he led the Confederacy in a way that was not very democratic and alienated a lot of his own supporters. But his own life story is interesting. I thought he was from a rich family and he, he's from a family kind of like Lincoln's. He's born in Kentucky, not that rich, ends up in Mississippi. His older brother, Joseph Davis, did most of the heavy lifting of creating their plantations, which were uh, adjoining each other on what used to be a peninsula, uh, kind of near uh, Natchez, Mississippi. And then the Mississippi River cut through that peninsula and now it's an abandoned island called Davis Island. And they got so desperate for employ employees that they, these people who were so pro-slavery formed an unusual labor relationship with some of their slaves giving them a fair amount of control over the, the plantation. So the story is not as simple as you would think. And I think a, there could be a really good Jefferson Davis book that has not been written. Uh, and this may not be a fair question, but you've extensively researched Lincoln. Someone wanted to learn about Lincoln. What few books would you recommend for someone who wanted to know more about it? Well, we've, we've mentioned uh, Harold Holzer, and he has, I think he's written about 50 books, but I did love Lincoln, President-Elect, and he has a couple books about individual speeches, one about the Cooper Union Address, it's really good, about how Lincoln went from being a small-time politician in Illinois to suddenly the leading candidate, for, or one of them, for the nomination. There's a book I love called Lincoln's Melancholy by Joshua Wolf Schenck which is about Lincoln's struggle with mental illness. And that might come as a surprise to people, but he had a problem with depression and many, many people do. And the, what's remarkable about the story, it's very well reported, but the story is a success story. So he, he wrestled with serious bouts of almost suicidal depression as a young man and then conquered it. And he had, he, he could get near to his depression as an older man and, and as president, but by conquering it as a young man, he, he developed another form of strength. And I even think his capacity for sadness was something that was important to his ability to write these incredible empathetic speeches and, and to see things from the Southern side as well as the Northern side. So that's a, a book I love. Um, there's a book by Robert Penn Warren about the Civil War that he wrote in the 1960s. Was he from Arkansas? I'm having a little trouble remembering, but he's, or maybe Kentucky or Tennessee. C. Van Woodward was in Arkansas. Oh, was he? Well, he's certainly a great historian. But um, Robert Penn Warren wrote a beautiful essay on the Civil War around 1963 about the problems in each side. 
and how each side has a tendency to inflate its virtue when it's a pretty messy story. And I, I appreciated his short book a lot. I've loved the Ken Burns documentary that so many of, of us have, have seen. Um, and Edmund Wilson's book on the literature of the Civil War, Patriotic Gore. I, I've enjoyed that book a lot. And I appreciated Harold Holter's use of the word literary about my book, because I, I do love literature. And I, I have Walt Whitman in this book and Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I wanted to have a little bit of that, the sound of their voices in, in the book too. I wanted it to represent all of these different Americans including Southerners like Mary Chestnut, who C. Van Woodward edited her diary. And, and it's just more realistic when you have a lot of different voices in there. Uh, our time is about up, but I, I'd like to close with this question. Uh, Lincoln, of course, does return to Springfield. It's just after his assassination. It's, uh, that, that train trip, uh, in many ways, is... is, is uh, is a fascinating voyage too. You talk about that briefly at the end of your book. Uh, what struck you about that final train trip? Well, it's uncanny in many ways. It's this almost the exact same route. So it's like chapter two. Chapter one is coming in alive to, to save the country. Chapter two is going back dead after saving the country. And the outpouring of grief was incredible. Um, Americans had never participated in a, in a ritual of mourning quite like that. And just, you know, millions of people came out and he was uh, exposed in an open casket and in, in public buildings, including Independence Hall, that were open 24 hours a day because Americans felt a powerful personal need to say goodbye to this man who'd done so much to save him. And that felt like a chapter I needed to put in because the, the incoming ride was so dangerous and, and also so successful in introducing himself to a people he was now going to ask to do what was almost impossible to go fight a terrible war to save their country. And then after it had been won, they felt a need to say goodbye to him and, and, and did. So the outpouring of grief was um, just, a, you know, almost a seismic force over those two weeks in which the train went back toward Illinois. And then I talk a little bit about how he was buried, but he remains a little bit unburied because he, he moves around. His body has actually been moved quite a few times into different graves because people felt it wasn't quite grand enough. <laughs> but also we still wrestle a little bit with how we relate to him. He's, he's, a, he's the first Republican president and almost all Republicans, including Donald Trump, have talked about Lincoln. Donald Trump once did an event at the Lincoln Memorial. But Democrats love him too. Uh, people from very different backgrounds, heads of corporations, talk about Lincoln's leadership um, in the 1920s and 30s, leading communists and socialists in this country, we thought Lincoln was a man of the people. So Lincoln, we all want a piece of him. And that's another reason he's just so endlessly fascinating. Thank you so much, uh, Ted, a great, great session. Uh, if you're interested in American history, go out and get this book, Lincoln on the Verge. You will not be disappointed. I wanna thank, uh, uh, Professor Whitmer again for joining us tonight. And thanks to all of you for being here. If you want to copy of that book, they're at Wordsworth Books at 5920 R Street in Little Rock. Thanks again for joining us and good night. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.